We've got yet another awesome interview for you guys. Jose Antonio Vargas, what now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is we're a little different, Jose. Okay. Uh, so, uh, probably the most famous undocumented immigrant in America. Okay. Um, but better known for knowing, uh, winning a Pulitzer Prize. Not a big deal. Kind of a big deal, actually. Uh, worked at the Washington Post, Huffington Post, New Yorker. Uh, has done a great number of uh, documentaries, including Is This Alabama? Very curious about that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get into all of it. Okay. Uh, documented, a film by an undocumented American. Um, and he organized a vigil called United We Dream, where he got in a good deal of trouble. Um, uh, maybe my favorite um, documentary, White People. Oh, you saw it? <laughs> Just really white people. <laughs> it's on MTV. It's, okay. Yes, it's on YouTube as well. You can okay. check it out on YouTube. Right. And uh, now he's got emerging, hashtag emerging, is it US or us? Us, it's both. Emerging us, oh, emerging clever. US. clever. I yep, like it, yep, I like yep. it. Five years ago, I told you the truth about who I am. My guest tonight is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who recently admitted he is an illegal immigrant. You and the other people here illegally don't deserve to be here. Last year, I made a film called White People. There's already outrage from some corners over a new MTV documentary that the network says takes a look at white people. In 2016, I want to talk about us, all of us. So this is actually the U.S. Census form. Like, what do you check? White. I don't like that. It makes us. It makes us seem like yeah. we're all the same we're all people. Yeah. As people who look kind of racially ambiguous, people ask us, "What are you?" a lot, and so we're going around asking people, "What are you?" The majority of new Americans are coming out of Latina pussies, but the identity of what it means to be a Latina is largely up for grabs right now. There's a lot of common misperceptions, stereotypes, and racism associated with dating as an Asian man. I teach specifically Asian men how to date girls, and I'm also called the Asian Playboy. I'm Mexican American, I'm playing in the NFL. Having a last name like Sanchez is so different, you know, especially in football. I'll pass by people I went to high school with and they'll have no idea who I am. I'm like this Superman invisible person. Yes, I'm trans and that was a part of my history. I would never wish it to be something else. I feel like tech is kind of like the boyfriend that you think has a lot of potential. When you are an underrepresented person in tech, it is the death by a thousand paper cuts. Sometimes they're calling me the homo cholo just because of my my look. This used to be a black gay club, but it's now a parking lot. So there's really not going to be a spot for the gay people of color. Well, I didn't come from a privileged background. The first house that I can remember living in was two rooms, and the bathroom was outside. White privilege. I, I'm not buying that. Race is the third rail because Comedy has become segregated. Arab Americans have no one to really look up to that's in the media. Being an actor, every single role for Middle Eastern was terrorist. Asian lives seem to be caught in sort of this weird position because it's a black and white struggle and, you know, where, where do we fit in? <laughs> We're literally changing the face of what civil rights looks like. We are the founders of hashtag Black Lives Matter. I identify in a lot of different ways. I identify, I identify as I identify as an American Jew. I identify as, as, as being Arab. I identify as American. In the past few years, I've realized that a new chapter in American history has begun. The minority is becoming the majority. And together, we are remaking the mainstream. Help us tell America's story.
We're going to do a lot of things in this interview, okay? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what his deal is with the whole undocumented business, okay? Uh, and then we're going to talk about his projects. Uh, we're going to be light. We're going to be serious. Uh, and I'm going to be all over the board here, okay? okay. All right. I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to live out later, okay? But first, uh, I want to talk to you about your story, yeah, uh, and 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 challenge you on some some parts. Oh, of it. please okay? do. Yeah. All right. So uh, first off, uh, you didn't know you were undocumented in the beginning, right? Um, I found out when I was 16 when I went to the DMV to get a driver's permit. Uh huh. Came here when I was 12 from the Philippines. Thought everything was fine. And then went to the DMV to get a driver's license, like an A16 year old. Uh -huh. And then that's when I found out that the green card that my grandparents had given me when I got here was fake. And then you had gotten here when you were 12. When I was 12, my mom, right. my mom put me on a plane and said I was going to go to Disneyland. Uh huh. So really, <laughs> since then I have, I have a very mixed emotions about, about planes, Disney, about Disneyland. Oh, about Disneyland. In general, yes. <laughs> okay. No offense to Disney, but just very kind of you know I right. feel like. Wait a second, I thought I was going to Disneyland. I didn't know that I was going to, you know. Stay so when here. after the Super Bowl and they go, I'm going to Disneyland, you're thinking, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> like you got a whole different <laughs> exactly. thought on it. Okay. So you came from the Philippines when yep. you were 12. When I was 12. And did you, by the way, did you ever make it to the Disneyland or no? Once. Okay. And I think I, I kind of, it was a choir trip. Uh -huh. And I think I cried. <laughs> At, at that point, I already I knew that I was already undocumented. Uh -huh. So being in Disneyland didn't feel like being in Disneyland. Uh, <laughs> I felt like how wait old a were second. you? At that point, I was seventeen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they say you're gonna be all right, dog. You're going to Disneyland. Yeah. You get to your grandparents. There ain't no Disneyland. Uh, but at, at twelve, you don't know what documented or undocumented well, means. Thing, and and I remember when the woman at the DMV said to me that the papers, you know, that the green card was fake. <laughs> I remember the first thing that came to my mind was like. I'm not Mexican. Oh wow! I mean, that's they, I mean, really interesting. Do you remember though? This was 1997. The Pete Wilson uh -huh. Prop 187 uh -huh. illegal immigrants are taking over California era, uh -huh. and the way the media reported it was it was it was a Mexican thing. Right. And I remember actually looking at this woman, and she was like this white woman with glasses, and she had curly hair, and she just like this is fake. And the first thing I wanted to say to her was like, I'm not Mexican. Uh huh. I don't know why. Maybe I just felt like because she kind of had this really stern look. Because uh -huh. she said, "This is fake," and then she lowered herself. Don't come back here. Oh wow! Okay. So, but I remember thinking the first thought was, "I'm not Mexican." Uh -huh. The second thought was, "Wait a second, what?" And then I, you know, I was riding my bike. <laughs> to, uh -huh. I rode my That's bike to the DMV. I didn't have a license. Didn't have a license. Yeah. So, and then I rode my back 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 home to my grandparents' house, and my grandfather was a security guard, and. He worked the graveyard shift, so he was always home during the day. Um, so I saw him, and I was like, this is what the woman said. And the, my grandfather said two things. What are you doing showing that to people, the mm -hmm. green card? Because I wasn't supposed to. I actually uh -huh. stole it from their cabinet. in the Because uh -huh. I didn't tell them I was going to apply for a license, right? Uh -huh. And the second thing he said was, you're not supposed to be here. Oh, he so said that's, that. Right. So he confirmed that the woman at the DMV was right. right. But again, the whole time I kept thinking... You know, the media, even uh -huh. as a 16-year-old, you know, I was already watching a lot of news, and the media always said it was a Mexican, Latino thing. Right. And again, as a 16-year-old, I, I inter interchangeably use Mexican and Latino, right? Right. Um, yeah. But of course, it's not. Right. And so, I get it that it's 100% not your fault. I think anybody who's reasonable who uh, is watching gets that part. Yeah. But then a lot of people will say, okay, so, but you didn't have papers. You're not supposed to be here. Yep. So, what's the beef? Like what? So. So why stay? Why stay? So actually, so I didn't tell another another adult. I didn't tell an adult who wasn't my grandparents that I was here illegally <laughs> until my high school principal was starting to wonder why I wasn't applying to colleges. Uh huh. This was before there was Google. There was no Dream Act. I'm sure you probably know what the Dream yeah, Act course, is, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. So that's when I told my principal. I was like, um, actually. I can't go to college because I can't get a scholarship, whatever, right? So that's when I told an adult. And then she ended up telling like three other adults and they all tried to adopt me. They were like, oh, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we fix this? So, you know, right. and again, no one talked about this, right? So they met with lawyers and the lawyer said, it's too late. He's over 16. Oh, no. If I had told people, now mind you, my grandparents, you know, they're U.S., they were naturalized American citizens, but they're not necessarily educated people, mm -hmm, right? Like, mm -hmm. my grandfather's plan was stay here, you know, 
put your head down, marry a woman, and then we'll get you your papers. That was the plan. Well, okay, I get it. But I'm gay. Oh, so I told that's them. A, that's it. <laughs> you know, around, around the time. Foiled I'll, again. So, okay. uh, and I remember, around the, you know, I was in the closet about being gay and undocumented for like t about a year and a half in my life. And uh -huh. I just knew that I had to get out of one of these closets. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area in California, so it was easier to come out of the gay closet. So it took <laughs> 12 other years to get out of this other one. But, wow. but, but to your question, I remember after 9-11 happened, I was already in college because of a scholarship fund that this parent, Jim Strand is his name, he just mm -hmm. decided to send me to college. Didn't ask any questions about papers. After 9-11 happened, Jim Strand and my high school superintendent were like, okay, it's time to fix this. Let's go meet a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So we went to the lawyer, for the, an immigration lawyer. And the immigration lawyer said, it's really bad now because of 9-11. The only option Jose has is to leave, mm -hmm. leave now, accept a 10-year bar. Wow. And then try to come back. Okay. Now, you know what the 10-year bar, where did that come from? The right. Clinton administration. Oh, the 1996, yes. If it wasn't for the Clinton administration, this is something that Hillary Clinton doesn't get asked a lot about. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for the 1996 kind of immigration reform bills, I mean, kind of different kinds of looking at how do we further criminalize immigrants, mm -hmm. they wouldn't, we would not have needed a DREAM Act. Mm -hmm. There would not be a 10-year bar. Right. So because of that, after the lawyer said that, I remember sitting in the lawyer's office in San Francisco, in downtown San Francisco on Montgomery Street. I'll never forget this. And I remember thinking, OK, I'm going to have to go. The uh -huh. lawyer said, right. leave. And then when we walked out of the office, Rich Fisher, my superintendent, who kind of looks like Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry my, to hear that. My, who's, he's like my dad figured in my life. Uh -huh. Rich Fisher said, you're not going anywhere. Uh -huh. You're already here. Uh -huh. Just keep going. Now, if Rich I, I Fisher, like this, I like this bizarro Dick Cheney, who's actually a <laughs> no, good guy. But, but 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 if it's but if it wasn't for Rich Fisher, Pat Hyland, Jim Strand, Mary Moore, all these people from my high school, if they didn't say to me stay, I would have totally left, right? Uh -huh. So, but I mean, but to me, by the way, one of the biggest stories that we don't talk about immigration in this country are the stories of those people. Like mm -hmm. how many people are those? Like white, black, Latino, Asian, whatever, who are who are filling in the gaps that the government can't seem to figure out. Yeah. Right. So, um, and by the way, Jim Strand gave you the scholarship because you yeah. didn't get a scholarship because you didn't have documents. Which is still the case in many parts of this country, right? Right. Like you know, and in in the state of Alabama, right? Mm -hmm. if, even if you go to high school in Alabama, you can't go to college if you're undocumented in mm -hmm. Alabama. So you could have a 4.0, you can have a best. In the state of Georgia, you, you cannot go to the top five schools, top mm -hmm. five colleges. So they're like, okay, you've got uh, perfect SATs and GPA, but you're undocumented. We'll let you into the sixth best college in Georgia. That's the rule. Well, I mean, my question about this is this, like, you know, all these undocumented young kids, we can't all babysit your kids, you know, and serve <laughs> you drinks, you know, well, that was, I think and that mow was your part lawns. Of the plan. Yeah. Uh, right? I mean, I mean, let's talk about it, right? No, I, mean, right. You know, I mean, sometimes, you know, when, when people say that the immigration system is broken, mm -hmm. which is true, but then you have to really ask yourself, is it deliberately broken? Oh, I have an answer for that. <laughs> My answer is, of course, of course, of course it, it is. is. It's for cheap labor. It's not an accident. It it's not an accident. Corporations and, and it, will, it not even the giant corporations, that's what happened eventually. But even in the beginning, just businesses, small businesses, they just wanted cheap labor. And they didn't want to pay, and, and so and we are, we as a country have always been addicted to cheap labor. Mm -hmm. Like we put a sign out of the U.S. Mexico border that says, you know, keep out. And ten yards in, what do we say? Help wanted. Yeah. You can't have. And by the way, these are the kind of you know you mentioned emerging us, right? These are the kind of nuanced, contextualized, hard questions that we're going to explore on, explore on on emerging us. These are the kind of questions that you don't see the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all these other news organizations asking. Right. And I mean, you say we were addicted to cheap labor. I think in the beginning we were addicted to free labor. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> Again, talk to. Right. Talk, I mean, who built the? Which is why it's ironic. I mean, I guess it's not ironic. In many ways, I remember when I was in Alabama. You know, we made this video series called "This This Alabama" with Chris White, yeah, a wonderful filmmaker. He made about a boy, American Pie, mm -hmm. and we partnered up to do this video series. I just couldn't believe. You know, in college, I majored in African American studies in college. I just couldn't believe that the same South, right that is still struggling you know with this idea of you know 
equal rights for black people. You know, now that President Obama is in the White House, what are they going to do? They're going to start criminalizing brown people, right? Yeah. I mean, is that? I guess it's not surprising. Yeah. So I hear you on that, and it, what, I, I drive right wingers crazy when I say the original undocumented immigrant was Christopher Columbus. I didn't see any papers on that guy, right? The guy got uh, lost, <laughs> right? Isn't that why we call people Indians? Because he right. thought he was going to India. Like, how do we unpack and deconstruct all these lies and all these myths that we tell us about ourselves? Like when, like when we say that we are a nation of immigrants, what do Native Americans and Black people think about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that 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 itself, right, is the lie that we. Yes, we are a nation of immigrants built on the back of free, cheap labor and taking indigenous land. Shouldn't we say that? Well, I, I actually think that the only people who have a really good case against the undocumented immigrants are the Native Americans. That's why when we made white people, you know, in, in the MTV film, I could not have made this 45 minute TV special for MTV on white people without going to Native Americans. Yeah, because if for the rest of us, undocumented immigrants has led to cheap labor mm -hmm. and and somewhat by extension cheap produce and and, yep. and different things and so it made our standard of living better in a lot of ways mm -hmm. right although we don't want to recognize that no of course not we don't and we take uh, their taxes by the way and never return it in social security and medicare yep. and all that but uh, but for native americans the undocumented immigrants didn't turn out as well <laughs> right they turned out to to have taken all their land and given them disease and all that stuff well so. i mean i just remember when um, we were at pine ridge reservation it was mm -hmm. mostly lakota tribe and it started occurring to me that because you know I've been doing some tea party events across the country. It's really important for me to try to engage with people that actually think I'm some illegal alien faggot from Mars, right? Uh -huh. um, and I'm like thinking, what am I doing? You know, trying to convince you know Congress members to allow me here. Shouldn't we be talking to Native Americans if we have any, any right to be here? Yeah. Shouldn't that be the first people that we go to? Um, and by the way, I mean you know e even in this era of so much conversation about identity politics. We never talk about Native Americans. They're just not at all a part of the equation. So at Emerging Us, actually, that's one thing that we're going to be very intentional about, right? Mm. Um, just because it's so left out by the mainstream media in total. Yeah, you know, I, one of the things I realized about white privilege, and you, and you talk a lot about that, uh, yeah. is um, is that uh, the the fear that comes from something I hadn't understood until this uh, was crystallized for me in an article I read. Huh. It's the the fear that. What if they do to us what we did to them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So. That's the con. That is really, uh, we were talking to, if you look at the story of migration globally, right? Mm -hmm. um, apparently, there, there are a record 230 or so million migrants in the world. We don't know how many of them are, are, are unauthorized. We, we don't know. But what we do know is that many of them are migrating to the very countries that previously colonized or imperialized them. Mm -hmm. The jig is up. Mm -hmm. Right. If so, I was in North Carolina a few months ago, and um, I showed I made a film called Documented. Right. And after the film, I started talking about there are four million Filipinos in the United States. We're the third largest immigrant group: Mexicans, Chinese, and Filipinos. And mm -hmm. this man was like, "Why are there so many of you here?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all I could say to him was, "You know, sir, we are here because you were there." That's, That's a great way of putting it. Like, yeah. do you know your own history, the Spanish American oh, the, War? Oh, they have no idea. No, but, but, but again, like, in, to me now, in this era of Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Donald Trump, in many ways, is the, the manifestation of all these conversations that we're not really willing to have. And he, in some ways, he is like white privilege kind of manifest. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, think about it. The country. Yeah. I mean, this is where when 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 we talk about emerging us, right? The country's only to get gayer. Mm -hmm. More people will only come out. <laughs> it's only gonna get Fox News heads exploding. It's only gonna get speak. gayer. All right. It's only gonna get black or browner, more Asian. In mm -hmm. this country, in the next fifty years, eighty-eight percent of the total population growth is gonna come from Latinos and Asians. Eighty-eight mm -hmm. percent. So wow. black or browner, more know. Asian women will continue to women of all racial backgrounds will continue to break every possible barrier there must break. So what's left? Straight white men. Mm -hmm. How much change? Can straight white men handle? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we're seeing with this campaign right now? Yeah. And another article that just came out with another great uh, headline was um, White privilege is uh, thinking that when we bring you equality, they view that as oppression. Mm. Like, it, we didn't used to be equal, I used to be on top. So when, <laughs> when you bring equality, all of a sudden I'm oppressed. 
because I didn't have the, I, I no longer have the privilege I used to have. Well, I have to say though, I was just at St. Olaf College University like last week, literally mm -hmm. having this conversation about white privilege in a mostly white school. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening when I do these events is a lot of young kids, young white kids, men, come up to me and ask questions that they don't want to ask in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this young white student who's straight, white guy came up to me afterwards, after the lecture, I gave a lecture and said to me, sometimes like, I feel like I can't really say anything because I'm either gonna be racist, homophobic, or sexist. So I just don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Right, like we don't want to live in a kind of country. When I talk about the fact that all of these emerging changes are happening, right, and are in the state of California where we are right now, fifty-one percent of all Californians aged twenty-five and under is Latino, fifty-one mm. percent. And what did California do? Right, we started soy milk, almond milk, yoga. What starts here goes all across the country, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the reality. And what we don't want is to create this reality in which white people, right can't speak about these things. That's why on Emerging Us, one of the things we're actually gonna cover is what does it mean for white Americans to be an emerging racial minority? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Yeah. What does that feel like? Okay, and and I'm, I have a unique perspective here because it's unclear what race I am, right? Yeah, actually I, I was about to ask, you're yeah. ethnically ambiguous. You I can am. like pass, I, you can pass right. in that's a lot right. of ways. Uh, I, I'm not white, I'm not black, I'm not even quite brown, I'm, I'm actually olive. Okay, that's that's what people I'm say. I'm actually technically colorblind, but okay. <laughs> okay, hey, I don't look olive if you ask me. But <laughs> How anyway, do you identify? So I don't identif identify as anything actually. So it's trippy. I'm Turkish. Okay. Yeah, that so, I, I knew that. So but Turkish uh, is originally Asian, right? Came from mm -hmm. Central Asia, um, but is Mediterranean and Middle Eastern. Is both European and Asian. I was born in Europe, right? Huh. Uh, and and I'm an American. So. What box do you check in the census? Other. See, actually, so this is one of the packages that we have in Emerging Us. We actually film people explaining to us what box they check. Mm -hmm. And then I started figuring out, oh man, like, I don't think we know who we really are. And then what I started realizing is so many people lie in the box. Uh -huh. Like there's like actually Latinos who actually just check white. Really? And don't check Hispanic at all. Huh, that's interesting. Like they, there's something that's there. interesting. There's, there's something totally something there. there yeah. And then we interviewed this black woman who was like, because you know, in 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 the box it says black African American Negro. It actually still says Negro oh, in the census wow. box, right? Uh, and she's like, um, I'm Caribbean, yeah. so I'm black, but I'm not African American. That's right. My girlfriend was uh, for a long time was Jamaican, yeah, and she wouldn't let people call her African American. She's like, I'm not. I'm Caribbean. So, but isn't that interesting? But even right. the way we talk about that, even the yeah. way we talk about blackness, is completely you know oversimplified. But and that goes to the white kid's question towards you though, because he'd be so afraid to call her black, and she'd be like, "Just calm down, I'm black. It's okay." <laughs> I remember uh, the late um, comedian. I'm forgetting his name now. When it went on Jay Leno, Bernie Mac. Oh, Bernie uh, Mac. Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. He'd keep leaning into Jay and go, "I'm black." I'm black. <laughs> because it's Jay okay. kept saying African American. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So I'm a thousand percent with you there. We got to have the conversation. We have to, and you yeah. know, and, and uh, that's why you don't yell at people. Just hold on, hold on. Let's let's be cool. Let's try to understand each other's perspective. That's why I brought up the fact that I'm kind of this ambiguous, mm -hmm. racially ambiguous person, and I, I get it. I get all sides. I, yeah. I understand the perspectives of all the different sides here. And so, first of all, white people, don't worry. Minorities are not going to do to you. <laughs> What happened no. earlier, earlier in this country's history? Okay, and, and by the way, still globally some. too. It's global. Right. It's global as well. But mm -hmm. like, what is that? I mean, I remember telling this kid once, like, because he was like, "I feel really guilty," and I'm like, "Okay, but you know, like, you didn't, you didn't enslave people. You didn't do that." Y yeah. Now the question becomes, what are you gonna do now? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, are you gonna be silent? Are you gonna be awake? Are you gonna realize, like, why is it that black people are only? 13% of our population, yet 31% of all, you know, shootings, right? Like, yeah. are you going to ask harder questions about what systematic institutionalized, institutionalized racism actually looks like? Yeah, and so one, there's a thousand stats like that, but the one I, I like to focus on, and now Bernie Sanders is talking about it too, is, you know, we, whites and blacks uh, smoke marijuana at the same rate. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And study after study shows this, but uh, black men are arrested for it at four times the rate. So now what I ask, uh, 
not white audiences, because a lot of white people obviously get it, a yeah. lot of them are progressive and yada yada, but I ask the right wingers, right? Yeah. Say like, pause for a second and think about why. Like, it's okay to ask like, hey wait, let me, let me just think about this for a second, right? Is there something messed up in that? Or hey, yeah, of course, because, because what? Right? So let's just have that conversation and so that we can all begin to figure it out together. But I think that this is where I have to say, by the way, like, you know, like your show, what you was what you have built here is really unique, right? Like in the mainstream media space, we're not allowed to have these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. Right? Because first of all, they're only 30 second bites. So what can you fit in a 30 second bite, right? right. Like at a time in which we require more nuance and context. We don't have a media infrastructure that actually allows for that kind of nuance and context. Mm -hmm. For an exchange of, of, of idea in which we can actually disagree and say, you're wrong, I'm wrong, why are you wrong? Like explain, you know, right. that, yes. right? I mean, last night I was watching, I was watching the results of the election. I finally was like, okay, I have to stop. Went on Twitter. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, this is just getting too loud for me mm -hmm. without giving me what's really happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's why for us, like for me, so I've done, since this country can't figure out what it wants to do with me, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to deport me, so okay, I'm going to stay as busy as possible. So I've done maybe more than 600 events in 48 states in the past five years, right? So, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so, and with that, I realized that at the heart of this crisis in our democracy, is really the lack, the lack of connection when it turns to media. Mm -hmm. We don't have a media infrastructure that actually seeks to connect people, mm -hmm. to, to actually want to build empathy and understanding. We don't have that. Well, so th there's, there's so many things to say about all, all the things you just said. Let me just quickly note on that. So I, I worked in cable media and, and in cable news. And that's because it's structured for conflict. It's not structured yeah. for understanding. Yeah. So when you book a conservative guest, you book a liberal guest, and vice yep. versa. And you got to get them to fight because that's interesting TV. It's tension, right? So it's it's literally structured wrong. It's structured to make us fight rather than to make us get along. So by the way, so how did they, how did they decide they meaning the you know the executives? How do they decide that it sells more if people start yelling at each other? Mm -hmm. Probably uh, the, the honest answer to that is probably because it's somewhat true. Okay. Okay. Like that the they, Jerry Springerness of right, it. Right. They probably they look at the ratings and in TV they are obsessed with ratings. Yeah. They look at it every quarter hour for every show. So and then they'll try to divine who did we have in that quarter hour? Oh, we had Jose on and look at the numbers spiked. We should have him on again. No. I or mean, the numbers dipped. In reality, the numbers are totally actually, variable based on almost like so there you can see long term trends yeah. but they try to guess short term trends by reading the tea leaves which is impossible and so they'll be like oh that guess didn't work never have him on again oh for christ's sake so you know right? i have to say about this i remember a few months ago Shan, Sean Han Hannity cuz you know Ann mm -hmm. Coulter has a book to sell of course mm -hmm. she does mm -hmm. um they asked me to debate Ann Coulter on Hannity's show on Fox mm -hmm. and i had to really think hard about it i was mm -hmm. like do i do this do i not do this I try to do as much Fox News as possible because mm -hmm. it's really preaching beyond the quiet, right? Mm -hmm. But do I sit there and give Ann Coulter exactly what she's wanting? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry, but no. Especially in the context of TV where you only have five minutes, she's going to yell at you, they're going to side with her, yada, yada, right? And they're going to frame it the way they want. I actually did have a, a debate with Ann Coulter about immigration, but we took an hour. Okay. Oh yeah, at Politicon. At Politicon, right. I, we said no to that. <laughs> I said no to that. So you had to do it great. Okay. I couldn't do it. I was like, I just couldn't. What I mainly wanted to find out is, uh, is it an act, right? And in the beginning, she almost admitted that it was. But she's And then realized, wait, I shouldn't say that. Right? Has she got an award? <laughs> Has know, anybody right? given her an Emmy? It's a, she's a really good actress. I know, but she, it's, it really is a loathsome role to play. Right? Somebody has to play it, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess. So um, now I, I want to get into politics and the debate yeah. and what you thought of Bernie, Hillary, etc., and obviously Trump. But uh, but before we do that, let's finish your story because it, it, when you get stopped in McLaren, Texas, oh McAllen, I'm yeah. sorry, McAllen, Texas, um, it was a border check, right? Even though it's inside the country. The, the the difference is in most airports in this country, when you go through a check, there's mm -hmm. the TSA agent. They don't have a border patrol agent next to the TSA agent mm -hmm. at the Texas border. That's what happened. Yeah. So the moment I like showed my, I only have a Filipino passport that I can show people to travel. Right. So the moment the TSA agent asked me that, the Border Patrol was like, hey, what is this? Are you here legally? You know, this is what I do now. This, it's too late to lie. Right. <laughs> right? right, so, right. Nope, I'm here illegally. 
So the moment I said that, he handcuffed me and they arrested me. Um, I was only detained for about eight hours. Um, they put me in detention. It was so interesting actually because I remember one of the things that had to happen was the Philippine ambassador had to call uh -huh. just to tell the border patrol that I'm not Mexican. Because uh -huh. what happens is <laughs> when is they the pick theme. you up, when they pick you up and you're Mexican, they may actually just drop you off in the middle of the desert, right? And so they wow. had to they had to like thankfully my friend Alida Garcia, you know, was the one kind of like going around trying to figure out, okay, what what do we do if he gets arrested? Um, and you know, actually, I'm wearing the exact same shoes I'm wearing when I got arrested. When they arrest you, they take your belt and your shoelaces. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you never put the shoelaces I, back on? Because they didn't give it back. Border Patrol <laughs> didn't give it back. So, but when they arrested me, they put me in the exact same jail cell as the kids. Can you imagine, by the uh -huh. way, like that Central American refugee crisis, right? From right. two summers ago now almost. And they separated the kids by gender. So I was with the boys, uh, the mm -hmm. girls and the boys. The, it was probably between ages six to 14 year old boys. Wow, six year And I'm in a jail cell. It was probably like a little smaller than your studio. Mm -hmm. And so they put me in the cell with them <laughs> and I automatically confused the kids. Because whenever, mm -hmm. the, whenever the agent would come to check with me, Jose Antonio Vargas, and they look at me and I'm like, no hablo espanol, <laughs> you know, I don't speak Spanish. And then they probably have never seen an Asian guy with like big hair. Uh -huh. So one of the kids just started like playing with my hair. That's funny. But I'm looking at these kids and all I could think of was that we are so incapable in this country to have an honest conversation about not only immigration, but the root causes of immigration, mm -hmm. why people move, that we can't even look at these kids as kids. What did the media call these kids? Illegals, right? A bunch right. of illegal immigrants. What did Fox News say? We could. What did Hillary Clinton say originally? Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton said, "Send them back." Yeah, I want to ask you about that. So hold that thought for a second. By the way, if you don't know, Jose got uh, the Associated Press to stop saying illegal immigrants and yes. start using the word undocumented or unauthorized. Just people can't be illegal. I'm here illegally, but people can't be illegal. Okay. So now, but when they they arrested you there. I think some people would say, and I get why they're asking. Oh yeah. Um, well, shouldn't they have arrested you? You are undocumented. Oh, look, I have made my. I have. <laughs> the moment I did this, I was ready for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I was ready. I had like, I had, I had prepared my family. I was ready. At this point, President Obama was deporting four hundred thousand people a year. You, as you know, President mm -hmm. Obama has deported more than two million people, more than any other president, you know, president in the history of the country, right? I'm glad in terms we got of deportation. Yeah. Um, I was ready for that to happen. I didn't want to have to say, oh, I'm the, I'm the exception to the rule. Right. And I remember some people saying, well, you know, he has a Pulitzer, he's successful. The Pulitzer is only a piece of paper. Do you want it? I can give it to you. I'd mm -hmm. rather have a green card. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want it to be like this good immigrant. He's a model immigrant. He's one of the good ones. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. No, that can't because be Because you're in the club. Because you're, you know, you you won the Pulitzer. A lot of these uh, powerful people know you, so they can relate to you because they know you, right? Well, Whereas they can't relate to that six-year-old kid that you're in the in the same. How can we not relate jail. to those kids? Right, you know, they the don't very, know. The very first person in line when Ellis Island first opened was an unaccompanied young woman from Ireland named Annie Moore. She was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. She got in the boat by herself to go to America. Mm -hmm. So all I could think of was that story when I was, you know, watching all these children in a jail cell. Because we as a country can't have an honest conversation about why they're even coming here. Mm -hmm. You know, we are so stuck in this conversation about the border and Mexico that we don't even ask questions like, what does our U.S. foreign policy and trade agreements have to do with migration patterns? Mm -hmm. Why do people move? Why did El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras? Why did it get so violent? Who started the drug war? And mm, what did it do to mm. Central America? Right? Yeah. These are the questions, journalistic questions, mind you. Instead, we fall back on Morning Joe, for example, on a slightly different issue, but related uh, on why Muslims uh, have some issues with America, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe because, for example, Iran might have an issue with us because we deposed their democratically elected leader in 1953 and they didn't appreciate that. Instead, the media answers it with, with Joe's words, which were really symbolic of everything. They hate us because they hate us. They hate us because they hate us. I mean, what a shallow, don't you know, ridiculous I mean, you know, way of thinking. I don't want to drag James Baldwin into this, but most Americans are stuck in a history that they do not understand. Mm -hmm. And the past is not the past. It's very much present. And that's why for me, like the fact that you see the Black Lives Matter movement and the immigrant rights movement and the LGBT rights movement and the women's rights movement and the income, all of these movements are clashing at each other. 
right? The intersections are all happening. And yet, how does the media frame it? A mostly black and white conversation. Mm -hmm. A conversation that's all about politics, but not about people. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so you're prepared to, to go back to the Philippines? Oh, I was prepared since June 22nd, 22nd 2011. Mm -hmm. You know, I what mean, would you do if you went back there? You, well, I don't it's know. Not your country. I mean, you I mean been there my since mom you were is waiting for me. It's been uh -huh. 23 years this August, uh -huh. right? I have a sister who's 24. When I when I left, she was one and a half. I was actually there when she was born. I was in charge of the umbilical cord. Uh -huh. um, so I have a family that's waiting for me there. Uh -huh. But you know, my mentors, you know, all those all those people in from Mountain View High School, all of my teachers that didn't seem to care about papers. I kind of owe it to them, and I owe it to my grandparents for all the sacrifices to stay. Yeah, you know. And well, um, I'm a I'm a believer in stay and fight. Uh, but so let's talk about solutions. Yeah. So they say, okay, you're undocumented. They could send you back. Yeah. Right? You you agree that that that, that oh absolutely is, yeah, that's oh, within yeah. their rights, right? So what should America do with undocumented immigrants? Should we if if we say okay, let everybody staying, right? Yeah. Um, uh, the argument would be, well, doesn't that encourage more people to come in an undocumented fashion? And in fact, I'll go further. So that uh, Jamaican girlfriend that I mentioned yeah. earlier, she uh, applied in a legal manner, mm -hmm. and it took so long that she eventually gave up hmm. and went back to Jamaica. Okay, I, I, don't, I think it was over a decade. And she's so like, my mom is in a 16-year waiting list to come mm -hmm. because. But your question, though. Go, but go ahead. I think you, you're trying. Yeah, to no, your I'm saying. So, what do you think is the solution? If we do, we say, "Hey, everybody can stay." In which case, does that not encourage others to come in an undocumented fashion? Now, again, so let's let's kind of unpack that question. So, illegal border crossings are at its lowest levels since at least two decades. Right? Mm -hmm. There are more people going to Mexico than Mexicans coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because the Mexican economy is actually doing relatively well. Right, so but, maybe the Mexicans will pay for that wall. Well, <laughs> but back to this question. <laughs> to keep of, us out. <laughs> but 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 to me, the, the bigger question is why are people coming? Right, I mean, this country used to have a, used to have a bracero program, right, for seasonal workers. We mm -hmm. don't have that anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Although, as we know, I'll, he, here in California, if it wasn't for undocumented farmers, who would harvest all those crops? Right. Well, as they found out in some of the southern states when they North actually, Carolina, Alabama, Georgia. So when they kicked out yep. undocumented immigrants, it turns out the answer was no one. No one would so, do it. So before we figure out what our actual reasonable policy is, we have to ask ourselves some of these harder questions that we have not been able to ask ourselves, right? Then after we do that, we have to decide what kind of policy do we want. Now, if you want me to wait 20 years, I've been waiting 23. I'll wait. You want, mm -hmm. you want me to wait 20 more years to be an American citizen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill. I went. I went on Bill O'Reilly like a few months ago, and Bill O'Reilly said, um, "Jose, just so you know, you don't deserve to be here." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, "Wait a second, like, what did Bill O'Reilly ever do to deserve to be here?" <laughs> when people <laughs> say, "When people question. say that undocumented immigrants like me should earn our citizenship," and I do agree with that. I've been trying to earn mine since I was sixteen. Mm -hmm. right? My question is, well. What are Americans doing to earn their citizenship? So that's why I argue that I'm actually the most patriotic, most American guy out there because I chose to be an American. I'm a naturalized citizen. Bill O'Reilly happened choice. to get he happened to get born in Long Island. That was just a, 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 a you know free descendant accident. of Irish immigrants. You know how did these right. Irish immigrants get here? What papers did they have? Was it before Ellis Island or after Ellis Island? Right. So, but, but, but again, these are the questions that, to me, I actually think undocumented immigrants in this country. Show Americans what it is to be an American, mm -hmm. because you have to fight for it. It's right. not something that just you know. Can you imagine all these people? I mean, we're in Los Angeles, right? Los Angeles, in many ways, is the epicenter of the undocumented population in this country, mm -hmm. right? Can you imagine this city without undocumented people in it? So all these people that Donald Trump, you know, talks about as if they're like aliens, off people's insects, off people's backs. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine every day they have to wake up, mm -hmm. get out of bed, get on the bus? Because some people are afraid to drive sometimes, although in California people like me can drive now, just to get to work and provide for their family. Is there anything more American than that? Yeah. And well, if they left, it'd be like in one of those apocalyptic movies where everybody's gone, <laughs> right? In Los Angeles. It'd exactly. Be, yeah. I mean, at least I, I don't know what percentage, but it's a high <laughs> percentage. So, uh, so now let's get to the specific solutions. So you logically say, hey, listen, you got a right to do it, but I'm trying to earn my way into citizenship. Yeah. So let's figure out how, right? How? Let's put our heads together. Let's what figure does that out look like? So the last proposal, the one that uh, Rubio got crucified for yeah. and lost uh, his election, among other reasons, but that was a huge part of it, 
is they said 14 years is a pathway to citizenship. Yeah. I, I, I objected to that because that was double what indentured servants had to serve. Now, I have no, look, I am, I am not even supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. I, you guys figure out what you think is fair, mm -hmm. and after you decide what that is, I'm gonna ask you about your own history, mm -hmm. right? right. And, 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 but now I think we have come to this point in this country now where we have to figure out what the solution is. But here's Donald Trump, you know, emerging us, right? We just cut this video about the facts there's been 12 presidential debates on the Republican side, right? Mm -hmm. Immigration always comes up. Yep. Yet, whenever immigration comes up, the narrative, the master narrative that the media puts out is that these bunch of people take, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard somebody say that undocumented workers like me have contributed $100 billion to the Social Security Fund in the past decade? You, well, know what, you, know what, <laughs> you know what the source is for that though? The Social Security Administration. That's right. Isn't it really interesting that while ICE and DHS are trying to deport us, Social Security doesn't care? They're gonna, I, I mean, I like to, you know, when I talk to Republican Tea Party crowds, I have paid so much taxes, I should be a Republican. <laughs> I have. So, and I want people at home to understand this, because if you haven't heard this before, see, when, when they're getting a paycheck, the Social Security and Medicare is taken out, the payroll yep. tax is taken yep. out. But since they're not documented, they never get it back. So they can't get the Social Security now or Medicare you, back. I like the road, uh -huh. I'm a product of public schools, I'm uh -huh. happy to pay my share. Right. You know, I, I have no problem with that. But can we not, you know, call people like a bunch of criminals? Well, there's a second layer to that, Jose, which is really interesting, which is that uh, like Bernie Sanders wants to change the system uh, and he blames uh, what's wrong on the most powerful people in the country, the mm -hmm. ones that pull the levers, the ones that are yeah. rich, powerful, etc. Donald Trump says, no, actually the people that are causing the problem are the most powerless people in the country. Undocumented immigrants, uh, Muslims, Really, we have like there's Muslims are too powerful in this country. Undocumented uh, uh, Latinos that are coming in uh, from Latin America and Mexico are the the ones setting the rules. Who can, if you thought about it for a second, who could possibly believe but that? But look, I I know this for a fact because I've met and talked to a lot of people about this. Americans are so angry and they want someone to blame and they think it's people like us. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, how do we talk to them? Like one of the things we're doing at Emerging Us, I'm really excited about, is to actually get undocumented workers to talk to white working class people who have lost their jobs because of them because of the manufacturing jobs have left. Great, I love it. How okay. do you get them to talk? And you know what? If we get them to talk, I bet you they're going to find that they have so much more in common than not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, it's funny. I have an idea for a similar TV show. Oh, you I, do? I, I, Great. I don't, we I don't can work want together. Anyone stealing it? So I'm not telling you. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so, but let's talk uh, even more specifics. There's a big debate about immigration on the Democratic side that was far more substantive. Yes. And then they got into Hillary Clinton uh, saying, "Well, I voted for immigration reform." And you didn't. And and then Bernie Sanders saying, "No, that immigration reform was actually terrible." Uh, so, who's right? Well, I have to say, like, it's it's really tough when it's really tough to parse out the differences between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders when mm -hmm. I look at the opposite. When I look at the other party, right? right, and that's why for me it's like I, I appreciate the fact that Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton have really pushed each other. Mm -hmm. I think Bernie Sanders, you know, Bernie Sanders was really smart. He hired two of the most respected and documented people in his staff, mm -hmm. Cesar Vargas and Eric Andiola, right, mm -hmm. who are friends of mine, and they've done a really good job, you know, trying to get Bernie Sanders to understand this issue in a much more personal and humane way and offer substantive solutions, right? And I think that has really pushed Hillary Clinton. But however, look, look, the two, none of these bills are perfect, right? The 2007 bill, the 2012 that passed the Senate that Marco Rubio co-signed as the Gang of Eight. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was being asked to advocate for that bill, my problem with it is how many more billions of dollars do we want to spend on this border? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many more billions of dollars do American citizens want to spend on a border that's never going to be fully secure? Well, not only that, now you have the amusing situation that you alluded to earlier, which is that if we built the wall, since more Mexicans are leaving so than entering, we, we would actually be keeping them in. And, and, then, <laughs> and, and, and then what if I told you that 40% of the undocumented people in this country overstayed their visa and didn't cross that wall? What if I told you that the largest number of undocumented immigrants, the fastest growing number of undocumented immigrants are Asians, not Latinos, mm -hmm. right? Right. So again, these are facts. Right. That for whatever reason don't make it to the media when when they report on this issue. So it was really tough for me to even advocate for that 2012 bill because I was like, how, when are we going to stop lying to ourselves about what we're really talking about? 
when we say we want to keep the bo- we want to build this border, what are we saying, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, and so when, when it comes to Hillary and Bernie, I mean, clearly they have differences, but I would rather focus on how do we move forward now? Like, what does that look like, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Hillary Clinton, you know, the only reason she's been winning these states is her support not only within the black community, but also within the Latino community, right? Although you see the mm-hmm. generational difference. A lot of young Latinos are going to Bernie, yeah. older ones are going to Hillary. Which, by the way, was the case in 2008, too, when mm-hmm. Hillary was running against Barack Obama. Yeah. Um, so, but now, how do we move this forward, especially if we're looking at running, you know, if Hillary's going to run against, you know, um, Donald Trump. Although, mm-hmm. I have to say, I, I have to say this, I don't know what you think about this. I don't think it's over yet between Hillary and Bernie. I, yeah, don't, no. I don't think so. Well, um, I, I was very much in that camp until last night. Uh, last night was, was a big blow. Yeah. So, uh, Bernie is definitely still in it. But he's got to start sweeping right now. Like and, but, he's got nine nine election contests in front of him uh, that are uh, more in uh, on his, his side. Favor, yeah. yeah, more in his favor. But he's got to win them, and he's got to win almost. Well, all I'm of just it. excited that you know I've lived in California. You know, I grew up here. Like for the first time, the California primary for both parties is actually going to matter. I would yeah. want to know: Is California going to actually go for Trump on the mm-hmm. Republican side? I would just want to know. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I, 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 that's the thing. I'm not sure I want to know. Oh, I want to know. You no, know, like, they, do your neighbors really? You know, I don't want to go talk to them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, but that's why we've have our reporter on the road on TYT politics. Yeah. Jordan's on the road, and what he's doing is he's talking to Trump supporters. Then he's talking to Kasich supporters, Bernie supporters, Hillary yeah. Clinton supporters, finding out amazing things. The Trump guys are, are what you think they are. <laughs> okay. The Kasich guys are nerds. They're cerebral. They like policy, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, the Bernie people are enthusiastic. The Hillary Clinton people that show up at events are largely union guys. And this was my question last night when we were watching the results. You know, like how many of these Bernie supporters are going to show up if it's Hillary? I don't know. Well, that and, is and, a question. And, that and you look at the turnout. It's very you, hard to You answer. look at the turnout in all the swing states: Ohio, Florida, right? I mean, the turnout on the Republican side is really quite high, right? I, I know the Democratic establishment is so overwhelmingly pro Hillary. They think she's more electable, which is just counterfactual. Yeah. Every poll shows that Bernie Sanders is more electable uh, and that he appeals to independence so much more than she does. So, my note of caution to them is be careful what you wish for. And for me, though, I mean, again, this is where I remember when I covered, when I was at the Washington Post, when I covered the 2008 campaign, and I was looking around and I'm like, yo, like, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, you probably do, but like, American newsrooms are actually less diverse now than they were when I started in journalism in 1999. Mm-hmm. No, right? no, I did not know that. Um, so in a country that is more and more diverse, our newsrooms are less and less diverse, right? I remember when I, we were covering, you know, in Iowa, I was like, around going like, there are not a lot of people of color and not a lot of women, you know, mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. covering just the campaign. Um, so how do, now that identity politics is really, you know, in some ways, like the big elephant in the room, if it's Hillary, if it's, you know, how are we going to report on these issues? Like, how are we going to make sure that we're not falling into the tired cliches? Right. You know? So let, let me press on, though, in one specific, because I'm really just intellectually curious about it. Um, and I don't have an answer for yeah. it. Hillary Clinton versus Bernie Sanders on the issue of the kids from Honduras. Yes. Okay. So uh, she said, no, no. Uh, Bernie Sanders says you didn't want to let the kids in, right? You were in the in the prison with the kids, the jail, or that you explained earlier. Hillary Clinton says, "Wait, wait a minute! I didn't want to incentivize them to yeah. come from Honduras, which is a fair which point, is, which is a perilous path. It is a fair point. A fair point. Yeah. So, who's right about that? That's a really tough question. Well, <laughs> that is a tough question. But I, I would just say I remember hearing Hillary because she, I think she was being asked by Jorge Ramos, yeah. right? The, mm-hmm. the, the first time she adds. I remember thinking to myself, man, like, this is how toxic, how we talk about immigration is as a political issue. Mm-hmm. That Hillary Clinton, a champion of children's rights, you know, yep, yep. since she was a young woman, right? She can't even talk about these kids like they're kids, mm-hmm. right? Um, that's what I, I remember thinking about that. And that we can't even, I, I don't know if you heard the story about all these three year old and four year old migrant kids having to represent themselves. Mm -hmm. in front of immigration judges. Did you hear about this story? No, I didn't. These kids who are here, right, they have to represent themselves, three, four-year-old kids, in front of an immigration judge. That's what's happening in America right now, right? Yeah, but as I think about those those kids, 
it's a Hobson's choice. There's no winning. If you stay in Honduras in that time, it's very perilous to stay in the yeah. country. That's why their parents take the enormous risk of uh, of sending the them on that journey risk. because the the risk of staying is even worse. But then that journey is so hard. I mean, there's a that's lot the of bad risk. folks that's on a lot. that there's road, a lot, especially if you're a young woman, yes. right? You hear rape. Yeah. You hear a lot of the. But to me, the question then becomes back into this point, like. What is our responsibility to what is happening over there? Mm -hmm. And because of that responsibility, what do we do now with these kids? And the fact that they're appearing in front of immigration judges to represent themselves, you know, aren't we a country founded in due process of law? Yeah. Right? Like, Everybody's supposed to get a, a representation. So I'm I'm just so amazed that, you know, this is happening in the Obama era, you know, and we're not even it's not it's not a moral it's not a human it's not a humanitarian crisis. Now, let me tell you something. If these were kids from Canada, mm -hmm. if these were white kids, it'd be a complete. Now we would be talking about free trips to Disney World, <laughs> endorsement deals. <laughs> but no, they're a bunch of brown kids. Who cares? Yeah, I mean, imagine the the picture of the kid, and he's imagine. and he's got a 4.0, and his son, and then somebody wants to say no. You know, we don't want him in this country. It just seems and, and, and for me though, like it, it also gets to the point of. You know, and this is why emerging us to me was, is so important. Like, who are we and who are we becoming? Mm -hmm. To me, that is a core journalistic question that every journalist must ask when we do the work that we do. So, uh, you've been talking about emerging yeah. us, we mentioned in the beginning. Where can people. Oh, uh, please, see it? emergingus.com. So, we actually mm -hmm. launched, you know, instead of going to venture capitalists, instead of going to a big corporate media, mm -hmm. we decided to go the crowdfunding route. So, this is the largest ever. You, crowdfunding campaign for American journalism, a million dollars, mm -hmm. right? You guys started about, on February 18th. Did, 18th, you, fin 18th. did you start? We have until I mean, April, did you finish? We have until April 18th. Uh -huh. we have, so we need all the help we can get. Go to emergingus.com, you'll see where the link is there. And here's the cool thing, every dollar we raise is match. So if you mm -hmm. give 100, it'll be 200. If you give 500, it's gonna be 1,000, right? And more than ever, I mean, this is why, you know, really kudos to you for what you built here. We need more fearless, independent media to be asking these kinds of questions and providing as much context amid all the noise. Yep, and uh, yeah, more power to you. I, I, I well, love you it. set the example, so yeah. we're trying to figure out how we can make this happen. So uh, now, finally, to Trump. <laughs> okay, which is <laughs> unavoidable, but we did. Hey, we. I think we almost went an hour without talking about him. Almost. Um, so, how disappointed are you uh, when immigrants say they're going to vote for Trump? Because I've seen that a lot. I've seen Latino well, immigrants I, say. I see it within my own Filipino, yeah. you know, circle. Um, disappointed, yes, because I don't think you know. I mean, I think Trump is tapping into something that is so visceral with people, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for me, and this is a question I, I've had to ask myself since I found that I was here illegally, and that my grandfather said you're not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. The question is, how awake am I? Mm -hmm. Right, like, how do I make sure that I understand that how I how how I stand like amongst all these other people, right? Mm -hmm. like, meaning, how do I make sure that you know I that it's not just about immigrant rights, but it's all these other issues? And I think what Trump is really tapping into is this anger and frustration and this sense of a country being taken away. Right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. what the slogan: "Make America Great Again." Right. At Emerging Us, we just created this video that said, um, we're going to make, and we do make America great, not you. Mm -hmm. Right? Fear, mm -hmm. right? The fear that Donald Trump is instilling, right? Like, I'm not, you know, it's so funny to me because I've been afraid. I mean, when I found that I was here illegally, I've been afraid of this government since I was a teenager. I spent all of my teenage and 20s being scared of this government. Now, it's like, <sighs> I'm not afraid of Donald Trump. If mm -hmm. anything, the one thing that I'm not afraid of is not confronting Donald Trump. I think if we are going to succeed as a democracy, we have to confront Donald Trump mm -hmm. and do it in the most fearless, in the most honest, in the most uncompromising way that we can. And it is up to journalists who are protected by the, by the First Amendment, right, to do their jobs. And how, many, and how many of them are failing at that? Too right. many of them are failing at that. So it, it, the way that um, the establishment press is treating Trump is fascinating, oh. and it, you can do a case study on on 
on what the press really is based on that, what the media is today in America. Because As a business? <laughs> yeah, because yes. when he first uh, came out as he might run and he did the birther yeah. thing, now this is many years ago, and I remember I was at the White House Correspondents Center when Obama made fun oh, of him, yeah. right? And he was pissed. And he was pissed and he was angry and the press loved it because at that it. point Trump didn't have any power, Obama had all the power and so they were like, yeah, <laughs> I got you and, 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 and they were derisive against Trump. But now that as he has risen up and has more and more power, they have become more and more deferential. Yep. So they went from questioning, pointing out uh, you know, inconsistencies to wait a minute, I got to get him on my air. And if I'm going to get him on my air, I got to kiss his ass. What about $2 billion in earned media? There was that report That's that just right. came out. That's Two right. billion dollars. So what happens? He calls Morning Joe in the morning, mm -hmm. right? Tweets the rest of the day and sets the agenda for everybody else. Yep. Like, I mean, I actually have to really give credit to the Huffington Post, right? Ariana Huffington yes, and Ryan Grimm absolutely. from the very beginning. And I think there's like a disclaimer. Donald Trump is racist, sexist. Like there's, you know, yeah. calling it as it is. Like, that's why for me it's been interesting. If Donald Trump had said about Mexicans what he said about Mexicans, if he had said that about any other group of people in this country, people would have been calling him racist from the very beginning. How long did it take? How long did it take? <laughs> yeah. I mean, didn't he get on to Saturday Night Live? Yeah. Didn't he like, so I would argue that in, in this country right now, we're re, what Donald Trump is doing for us is exposing all of these cracks, exposing all of these inequities. And now, you know, we have to figure out how how do you confront this? What does that look like? So what's the answer there? In, in like, let's take Saturday Night Live as an example. Yeah. Because um, on the one hand, you don't want to squelch conversation as we talked no, about no, earlier. I, I get that. We want to talk to Trump supporters, we want to understand what's motivating them and we want to talk through those issues. On the other hand, having them on SNL legitimizes them, right? And so like, and oh, so it's, it's a joke. It's no big deal. Hey, look, Mussolini on but SNL. But wait a second though. If he had said that about Jews, mm -hmm. if he had said that about black people, mm -hmm. if he said it about gay people, can you imagine? But, no. but, but in this country, it is culturally acceptable to be anti-immigrant. Yeah. Donald Trump has made it culturally acceptable. Well, the two groups of people you can always criticize in this country and have almost no reper repercussions are the M&Ms, Muslims, <laughs> Muslims and Mexicans. That, that's a free for all, that's no problem, there will be no consequences. But Trump did something interesting, he, we're the frog in the boiling boater, uh, water and he boiled us. Yeah. He started with Mexicans and everybody's like, oh that's cool, yeah, he yeah. went to Mex uh, Muslims, they're like, that's even better, no problem, right? And then uh, actually he went to a group of Jewish Republicans and he was deeply anti-Semitic. He said, you, you, guys, you guys would know about negotiating. Wait, why? why? <laughs> and then he said, nobody in this room, nobody would know better than this room on renegotiating, which is actually much worse. Okay? You know, I, you asked this question, but I have to say, like, when I look at my nieces and nephews, right, mm -hmm. American citizens born here, the teenage kids, right, and I see how they talk to their friends who are black, Latino, Asian, and how they understand this idea of what it means to show up for each other. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That you don't have to be black to say black lives matter. You don't yep. have to be an immigrant to say to fight for immigrant rights. You don't have to be gay to fight for LGBT rights. I see this in my nieces and nephews. And I think if there's anything, if there's a gift that Donald Trump may be giving us, you know, may, may be giving us, is, is that we see what solidarity and unity looks like and how it's supposed to be. Right. right. Um, I am I look I'm I'm alive so I can't be a pessimist I am holding on <laughs> I'm holding on to that idealistic part and you know I when I when I think of emerging us I think of my nieces and nephews and I think of how they understand America and how they see themselves in America and that when Donald Trump is speaking for an America you know that that is in decline but how do we talk to them and find empathy? How do we go to white working class people and say, we understand that you know manufacturing plants have closed and have gone the jobs have gone elsewhere, but you're blaming the wrong people. Yeah, the, Jimmy Dore, a comedian that's on the show all the time, oh. jokes about how uh, you know the again the progressives blame Wall Street for crashing Wall Street and Republicans blame the teachers. Yeah, like the oh. teachers are getting duffel full of bags and putting it into their. Toyotas, right? That's not what happened. It's just not true. It, the undocumented immigrants are the most powerless people in this country. To blame them for the powers uh, uh, that be and the, and the results of their actions is unbelievable. But it does happen. It's easy scapegoating. It's, it's happened throughout history. So that's why it's imperative that we have that conversation. 
Now, I just I, I wanted to ask, uh, Trump is a little bit easier to talk about because it's yeah. such a, if you will, a black and white issue. I yeah. mean, he's so clearly wrong, but yet he's not being treated as a black and white issue. I mean, they would never invite David Duke on Saturday Night Live, but they are inviting a much more dangerous racist in Barack Obama. Uh, and and but now the harder question is how you deal with President Obama and what your views are, right? Oh, well. Because now, on the one hand, you you have the Trumps of the world who does. Does the birther thing against mm -hmm. President Obama, yeah. and you have Fox News that blames him for everything. In fact, t earlier today they blamed him for Trump. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So on the other hand, he broke a record in, in deporting, deportation. Deportation, and he, in so many ways, he appears to be nowhere near progressive, and brags and is proud of of going and and proving he can out Republican the Republicans. So let me just let's talk about the progressivism part of this. I. I after all the traveling that I've done, and speaking as somebody who looks Asian, has a Latino name, majored in black studies, is gay, and documented, and made a film called White People, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. I believe that progress should not have a party. Mm -hmm. I think it hurts our democracy that when people think of the Republican Party, they think the anti black, anti woman, anti Latino, anti immigrant party. That hurts all of us. I hear you, but I didn't do it. They well, did it. But I'm just saying, <laughs> like, I think it hurts all of us, right? I would say with President Obama, because I remember I covered the 2008 campaign for two years and two months. You know, I was there when Obama first made his first trip to Iowa, right? Mm -hmm, I was mm -hmm. there. And I remember thinking, man, like this is, I, I remember actually telling David Broder, the late David Broder, mm -hmm. I said, um, sir, I called David Broder, sir. Um, I think maybe, because, you know, I'm on this Facebook thing and um, Obama is really popular on Facebook. And everybody was like, what's Facebook? And at one point I said to him, David, you know, sir, I actually think Barack Obama might win the caucuses. And he looked at me, he was like, you don't know politics at all, do you? I know. They've been <laughs> right? saying, they've been so saying they've that been to saying, me for a long time. <laughs> but you know, like I mean, because the they're Clinton They're never deterred by how wrong they are. <laughs> because anyway, the Clinton yeah. machine, right? How do you fight against the Clinton machine? Yeah. And I just remember the level, I mean, I remember being in South Carolina looking at the faces and the eyes of all these elderly black, you know, men and women who were looking at the you know, Senator Barack Obama and saying, I cannot believe I'm looking at possibly the first black president, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that the moment oh, Barack Obama gets elected president, right, the amount of racism, that's mm -hmm. purely what it is that he's faced, is unparalleled, right? Mm -hmm. No other American president has faced what he has faced. And that's why I feel really conflicted in talking about, can you imagine, here's the first minority, first African-American president who was overseen through eight years in the White House, almost eight years, right? The largest expansion of LGBT rights in this country. Mm -hmm. Who at the same time has deported more people, mostly Latinos, than in any other modern president. Right. Like that is, like that is like, where's Tony Kushner? Is this a play? Like, yeah. I remember when when um, when same-sex marriage, you know, when when the Supreme Court, right, validated same-sex marriage, right? They had a, they, they had apparently like a party at the, at the White House and a lot of gay rights people were there and the president spoke. I don't know if you remember this. And a transgender Latina immigrant woman started speaking up, uh -huh. right? And the president got upset and said, you know, have some respect. And then apparently her name was, um, her name is Genesette. I actually just recently met her. And apparently a lot of the LGBT rights people, mostly white, Gay people were telling her, "Shh, you know this is not the right time." Yeah, this when is, is it ever the, the right, right time? Place. But I just remember the image of the first African American president addressing gay people, saying, "You know, you're equal. Same sex marriage is the law of the land." While this transgender Latina immigrant activist is being told, "Shh, right, be quiet, right." So, so I don't know. I mean, I think I am. But look, I mean, I think. It's a tough argument. I mean, for me, I talk about this a lot with my friends who are undocumented immigrants who are black. They mm -hmm. don't talk about undocumented black people, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. mean, there's a big undocu black movement out there. Check mm -hmm. it out on Twitter, undocu black. Um, how do they feel about Obama? Like, you just give me a really great idea. I think we're gonna do that story. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, like that's, I feel really conflicted. But at the same time, I know that the president is has been battling since the very beginning of his presidency a level of opposition unlike anything the White House has ever seen. Yeah, I'm less conflicted to be honest with you. Oh, you are? Well, yeah, because uh, one, on LGBT uh, advances, he did it as begrudgingly as, oh, yeah. as, as well, anyone could. 
right? Like, ah, it went, was, are we at 70% approval rating on that yet? Okay, But fine, I'm sorry, the pro- I mean, but look, can you imagine this? I mean, I remember, again, when I was covering this. So George W. Bush gave us Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. Is Barack yeah. Obama going to give us Donald Trump? Yeah. Is the is the pendulum have to swing completely to the other side for us to realize that this shit is just broken? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, I hope not. I really really <laughs> hope that that and and I wouldn't that I wouldn't put on Obama. Uh but except No, but for I mean the, I mean but, but the way our politics work. I mean, this is why Citizens United is such an important fight, right? Yes, like yep. clearly clearly Clearly, right, and this is where I think Bernie Sanders, the media has not reported enough on this. The fact that Bernie Sanders has broke all online donation records set by Barack Obama is a huge story. They they actually never talk about a it. A huge story. But and that, so that's the amazing part of the invisible hand of power, right? Mm. Because they don't. They ne- you were in, you were at, at these organizations, Washington Post, Huffington Post, uh, uh, at New Yorker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I was in cable news. Now I wound up getting a speech at one point. That was very direct, so that that broke the rules where they said you got to act more like the establishment. But no, 99 out of 100 times that doesn't happen. It's it's far more incentives, disincentives, culture, yada yada. Um, but it, it, in terms of how the press knew that Obama would not bring change, so they were like, look at all the fundraising he's doing. Look at the success; it's yeah. amazing. Bernie Sanders, they know would bring real change. They're like what fundraising? Wait, you're never going to point out that he had, he raised more money than Obama, who you love and talk about. I noticed about? last night that C- MSNBC, CNN, and Fox wouldn't even air Bernie Sanders' speech. I think they cut him off yes. to wait for Donald Trump. No, it, they didn't cut him off. They never aired it. They at never all. aired it at all. The only people who aired it, I think, was us. And, and so, and, and then you wonder. So wait a second. How about all these millions of people that are donating to his campaign? Don't they want to hear him speak? Yeah, they showed an empty podium of Donald Trump rather than airing Bernie Sanders. See, speech. that to me again is it really tells you it it really tells you what we're up against here, right? In terms yeah. of the framing of all of this. Um by the way, I have to tell you something. No one has asked me this about Obama, and so let me just go back to that for just one second. You know, I have not I only met the president when I was covering him for the Washington Post. Since this whole thing happened, as you can imagine, mm-hmm. you know, the White House is probably like, we don't want anything to do with him, right? Mm-hmm. But as a journalist, you know, I would just love to ask President Obama, how does he explain this? Mm-hmm. How does he explain, you know, the deportation and in many ways the needless deportation of more than two million people? Like, how does he justify it? Uh, you know, you know, the president has a lot of presidents are obsessed with history, right? Mm-hmm. How does history look at this? It, it, I just, I just don't. I just, I just I, think there's a simpler answer. Which is he's not a progressive. Uh, so well, again, uh, again, labels <laughs> aside, you know, I'm not right. privileged enough to be a Republican or Democrat, progressive or conservative. I'm just looking at. As I got some, news for you. You're a progressive. Am I, I don't. I mean, but to me, <laughs> I mean, I get. I mean, I get. But to me, if, if being a progressive means that I believe in women's rights and I yes. believe in civil rights for people, and I believe, yes. well, then that's what I, it yes. is. Okay. I'm a progressive without a party. I guess yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No. The parties are partisan. Is stuff is useless. So to Democrat me, or Republican, list. it's yeah. not just it's there, it, and oftentimes it's Democrats and Republicans versus us, <laughs> rather, rather than Democrats <laughs> versus Republicans. But that's what I mean. It, so the fact that uh, they're racist against Obama and they've attacked him in a hundred different ways doesn't make him more liberal. Yeah. Right? It just you know it makes them more bad guys, but it doesn't make President Obama necessarily a good guy. His core instincts are go along and get along. Yeah. What does the establishment need? I'm going to give them what they need. Well, it's called politics, isn't it? I mean, yeah. to me, I mean, this is why. I mean, why this today? You know, he not today he nominates. You know, a Supreme Court nominee. Again. I mean, that's just kind of in the same way that okay, just so you can play nice with the immigration reform, I'm going to deport all these people. That's right. right? And did so, it ever work? No, See, that's why. That's it, the thing. It never worked. It, President Obama is an incredibly intelligent guy. I mean, Columbia, Harvard, constitutional Law Review, lawyer, right? All that stuff. So he can't possibly think after all this time. That if he gives Republicans most of what they want, they'll agree to anything. I don't. They've never agreed to so anything me, in this whole uh, term. They're not going to start now. So then the only remaining answer is no, no. That's the position President Obama wants. He wanted to deport those people. I that's actually, his position. And, and this is why you know all these minority marginalized groups that the Barack Obama campaign empowered in 2008. Right. Mm-hmm. The, he came to office, and all of a sudden, everybody in this country who've ever felt othered. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. felt empowered. 
right? Mm -hmm. and, in, and, and within that landscape, I mean, I remember when I was, I was in Minnesota, we showed this film called Documented that I made. After the film, this young black man, I think this was right after, it was right on Ferguson. This young black man said, hey, Jose, like, um, I want you to be a citizen, you know. You deserve citizenship. But I'm, I'm kind of conflicted because I'm born here. My ancestors are here. You know, we go back generations, right? Mm -hmm. We helped build this country. But I'm not even, sometimes I don't feel like I'm considered a citizen. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I wish this for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's powerful. That's the conversation. Yep. All right, and that's the conversation that's happening at an emerging... Emergingus.com. Us. Please check it out. All right, awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Jose. Thank you so much really for having me. Thank you.